The Confederate Navy was never large enough to challenge, say, the Federal fleet in a major naval engagement during the Civil War, but that doesn't mean that the naval component of the war wasn't interesting. One of the more interesting stories of the Civil War was that of the steamer Nashville, which one naval historian wrote was a ghost who for months ran the sea lanes of the world with scores of ships on her trail. The Nashville was originally a mail steamer for the Union, but she served the Confederacy as a raider, as a blockade runner, and eventually even as a privateer. Because don't all good stories involve pirates? The steamship Nashville was built in New York City, in the shipyard at the foot of 12th Street in Manhattan, owned by shipbuilder William Collier, under a section on shipbuilding in New York. The July 1853 edition of the New York Herald noted that the steamer was under construction, being built for Mr. Spofford Tileston and Company's New York and Charleston line of steamers. The newspaper reports, She's about 1,300 tons burthen, is 210 feet long, 34 wide, and 22 feet deep. She will be fitted with a side lever engine from the Novelty Works. In addition to the side lever engine, the Nashville was bark rigged and speedy, capable of 14 and a half knots. The Spofford and Talston line ran steamers carrying passengers and freight between New York City and Charleston. Launched on September 22, 1853, Nashville received a patent to carry U.S. mail, and so it had the designation USMS, United States Mail Steamer. The ship ran regular service between New York and Charleston, carrying passengers and cargo, as well as, of course, the mail. In April 1861, the Nashville would run headlong into one of the most momentous events in U.S. history. The Proclamation Declaration of the Immediate Causes which Induce and Justify the Secession of South Carolina from the Federal Union was unanimously adopted by the South Carolina Legislature on December 20th and issued on Christmas Eve, 1860. Despite claims that the Civil War was not prompted over the issue of slavery, the South Carolina Declaration made no mention of tariffs or taxes, but instead citing an increasing hostility on the part of the non-slaveholding states to the institution of slavery, accused northern states of violating law by not enforcing the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. Immediately after adopting the Ordinance of Secession, South Carolina made demands that the federal government surrender all federal property to the state. This would lead to a conflict regarding federal military facilities in Charleston Harbor. The commander of the U.S. garrison in Charleston moved his command to the not-yet-completed fort in Charleston Harbor, creating a standoff. By April, President Lincoln felt he had no choice but to reinforce and supply the garrison of the fort, despite that likely provoking a military confrontation. A relief fleet escorted by the armed U.S. revenue cutter Harriet Lane attempted to land reinforcements to the fort the morning of April 11th, but was driven back by artillery fire. The website to the United States Coast Guard Alumni Association explains that Harriet Lane returned to her station guarding the harbor entrance, and later that morning, the cutter observed the approach of a steamer flying no colors. The cutter ordered the vessel to heave to and show her colors. The unidentified vessel ignored these signals and steamed on towards Charleston. That ship was the Nashville, making her regular run to Charleston. Historian Virgil Jones wrote in his 1960 book, The Civil War at Sea. The Nashville, newly arrived from New York, appeared out of the mist with no colors flying, in such a manner that the Harriet Lane became alarmed and set a shot skipping across her bow, bringing the United States ensign to her gaff end immediately. A rebel lookout atop the lighthouse heard the shot, reported it, and it went into the official records. The Nashville had been a victim of friendly fire, albeit with no damage, and the crew had saved the vessel from further attack by quickly raising the Union banner. This represented two historic firsts. While there had been fire from shore batteries previously, the Coast Guard Alumni Association explains, historians consider the shot across Nashville's bow to be the first naval shot of the Civil War. Secondly, Jones explains, for here was fired the first shot at a vessel that was to become one of the most famous and elusive Privateers. Having been the target of the first naval shot of the war, Nashville finished her route to Charleston, where she was promptly claimed by the Confederate States of America. The Lancaster, Pennsylvania Examiner reported on May 1st, Mr. Spofford and Tileston have today heard from the South that their steamer Nashville has been taken by the authorities at Charleston, though whether it is a seizure or a forced purchase cannot yet be ascertained. Thus, the Nashville will be the first privateer under the Southern Confederacy. The ship would indeed eventually become a privateer, but first it would serve another role, 
The ship was placed under the command of Lieutenant Robert Baker Pegram, a veteran who had served both in the war with Mexico and in Commodore Perry's expedition to Japan. Ironically, he had been given command of a ship described as a privateer Pegram had in 1855, while commanding the U.S. Powhatan, been credited with the capture of several pirate vessels off of China. It was a shore battery commanded by Pegram that had first driven the Harriet Lane back in its attempt to reinforce Fort Sumter. Pegram outfitted the Nashville, including mounting bronze six-pounder cannons fore and aft for war. But the Nashville had not first been chosen as a privateer. Rather, Jones explains, the ship was chosen to have a dual purpose. It was to take abroad two commissioners appointed to represent the Confederacy in England and France, and it would bring back munitions. This was a critical mission. Confederate Secretary of State R.M.T. Hunter hoped that the commissioners, former U.S. Senators James M. Mason of Virginia and John Slidell of Louisiana, would be able to secure British and French recognition of the Confederacy. International recognition could turn the war for the Confederacy. The Union was highly interested in interrupting the mission. The Nashville was chosen because it was thought that her speed would be able to allow her to avoid a Union blockade. However, as Union naval forces around Charleston grew, Confederate officials feared that the Nashville, whose draft was deep enough that she could only use the main channel, would be captured. Instead of the Nashville, Mason and Slidell used another steamer with a shallower draft to escape the blockade using shallower back channels, eventually reaching Cuba and transferring the diplomats to a British ship, RMS Trent. It was a fateful decision. On November 8, 1861, the steam frigate USS San Jacinto intercepted the Trent and arrested the commissioners. This was the infamous Trent Affair. The United Kingdom protested, declaring the act of seizing a British vessel and taking the envoys illegal. The U.S. defended the act as an allowed act of capturing enemy dispatches, but in the end, seeking to avoid potential war with England, relented and released the two men. Mason and Slidell sailed to Europe, where, although finding limited diplomatic success, they failed in their goal of gaining international recognition for the Confederacy. When Mason arrived in England the following January, however, he learned that his capture might well have been avoided. CSS Nashville, the vessel that was first supposed to have carried them, was already at the Southampton docks. The North Devon Journal-Herald reported that the Confederate States steamer Nashville Captain Pegram left Charleston on the night of the 26th of October at 11 o'clock, passing over the bar at 12. When she started, the weather was thick and cloudy, but just as she was crossing the bar, the weather cleared up, and the moon rose brightly, lighting up in full view to the eastward, distant about four miles, two steamers of the blockading squadron, one of the United States steamer Susquehanna of 12 guns and the other of a powerful propeller gunboat. The Nashville, being under the land and from the moon, was not seen by them. Unlike the Trent, the Nashville had easily avoided the Union blockade and had been the first vessel flying the Confederate flag to enter English waters. The Charleston Daily Courier crowed on December 11th. Nashville reached Southampton on the 21st with the rebel flag flying, while the New York Daily Herald lamented, the name of the steamer Nashville has become as familiar to the public as that of Sumter. What's more, the now CSS Nashville had created a sensation when, off the coast of Ireland, the journal held reports, she destroyed the United States ship, Harvey Birch. The clipper, Harvey Birch, had been traveling in ballast from La Havre, France, bound for New York. The crew was taken aboard the Nashville, and the ship burned to the waterline. The crew were taken to Southampton and released. While some in the British press called the burning of the Harvey Birch piracy, Pegram argued that his was a ship of war of the Confederate Navy. The ship's arrival created a stir. The Leeds Mercury reported that at Lloyd's today, great excitement was caused and war risks advanced, consequent upon the news from Southampton of the arrival of the Confederate war steamer in its waters. While the United Kingdom decided to adopt a course of neutrality, the Queen did recognize the Confederate states as belligerents. This meant that their vessel would be treated as any other military vessel from a neutral state. Nashville could be in port and receive supplies, but could not receive military aid. The sloop of war USS Tuscarora was sent to intercept her, raising the possibility of a battle between the two within sight of the English shore. But English authorities enforced rules of neutrality, and when Nashville left port on February 3, 1862, Tuscarora was required to wait 24 hours before she could pursue. And thus, Nashville escaped. Francis Dawson, a 20-year-old Englishman who professed a sincere sympathy with the southern people in their struggle for independence, joined the crew of the Nashville at Southampton, 
seeking passage to the American South, where he hoped to join the Confederate Army. He provided a first-hand account of life aboard CSS Nashville. The morning after our departure from Southampton, the crew was mustered into the service of the Confederate States and signed the Articles. I was rated as a landsman or a boy. The crew were divided into two watches, and the regular routine of duty at sea began. I found that I had 12 hours on duty out of every 24, and that at no time more than four consecutive hours to call my own. For instance, today I would be on duty at 12 to 4 a.m., 8 a.m. to 12, 4 to 6 p.m., and 8 to 12 p.m., and so on in uninterrupted succession. This is rather hard work for one who is fond of comfort and late breakfasts, but I speedily learned not to lose any time in going to sleep, and undressing appeared a useless indulgence. Dawson gave a low appraisal of the crew's readiness for battle. When the weather grew fine, the crew were ordered out for drill, and from the recesses of the hold, our hidden armament was produced. It consisted of about 20 rusty smoothbore muskets. The muskets were given to the sailors and firemen, who were then drilled in the manual of arms by one of the officers. There was a good deal of difference of opinion as to what the commands meant, and the whole affair was very much a burlesque as even now and then a sudden lurch of the vessel would send three or four of the squad staggering down to leeward. When the command was given, ready, aim, and every musket was leveled at her instructor's head, the startled officer called out hastily, For heaven's sakes, men! Don't point your guns at me! They're loaded! The warning was not given too soon, for as they were dismissed, two of the men rolled up into the scuppers, their pieces going off in a very ugly report. That was the first and the last of the drilling. Nashville continued raiding. The Chicago Times wrote, On the 26th she encountered, on the margin of the Gulf Stream, the Yankee schooner Robert Gilfillian, Captain Smith. Bound from Philadelphia to Santa Domingo with an assorted cargo of flour, pork, butter, cheese, and other provisions. Removing from the schooner such of her cargo as was deemed valuable and transferring the crew to the steamer as prisoners, the prize was fired in a few minutes, completely destroyed. Returning to the North Carolina port of Moorhead City, Pegram was informed that the Nashville had been sold. The raider would now be employed as a blockade runner. Pegram left the vessel and in command to Lieutenant William Conway Whittle, Jr. The blockade runner escaped the harbor on March 17th. Whittle wrote, Steaming towards the bar, I found three vessels congregated close together, underway and covering the close channel. We were going at full speed. The blockaders underway and broadside to me were across my path. I ran for the furthest to the northward and eastward with the determination to go through or sink both ships. I was given the right of way and passed through under heavy fire from three vessels. Renamed the Thomas L. Rag, the former Nashville continued to evade the Union Navy. The Bristol, England, Western Daily Press wrote in May, What is the Navy Department about? It is known to all our readers that the Nashville from Southampton ran the blockade into Beaufort with arms and ammunition on board. It is equally well known that she ran the blockade out again in the face of two ships of war. By news from Nassau, which we published today, it appears she ran the blockade into Charleston and out again and proceeded safely to Nassau. Then on April 6, for some rebel port, after taking on board the cargo of arms of a British steamship. In all, the steamer would successfully run the blockade five times. But the vessel was finally trapped near Savannah, Georgia in the fall of 1862, leading to one more chapter in her career. Union Rear Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont was quoted in the New York Times. For several months, the Nashville was loaded with cotton, but though constantly on the alert, she never ventured out. She then withdrew up the Ogeechee River and reappeared thoroughly fitted as a privateer and presenting a very fine appearance. The steamer that had so vexed the Union Navy had once again been sold, and this time converted into a privateer and rechristened the Rattlesnake, although DuPont continued to refer to her as the Nashville. Of the refit, DuPont wrote, If I am not misinformed, she has a heavy rifle gun on a pivot as part of her armament, was proverbially fast, and would doubtlessly have rivaled the raiders Alabama and Oretto in the depredations on our commerce. But it was not to be. On February 27th, the Rattlesnake attempted to run the blockade one more time to again raid the Union merchant fleet. But the steamer grounded in the Ogeechee River, Seeing opportunity, Commander John Worden of the Federal Monitor USS Montauk braved fire from Confederate shore batteries and closed within range of the stranded vessel. His report said, A few well-directed shells determined the range and soon succeeded in striking her with 11-inch and 15-inch shells. I soon had the satisfaction of observing that the Nashville had caught fire from the shells exploding in her in several places. 
and in less than 20 minutes she was caught in flames forward, aft, and amidships. At 9.20 a.m., a large pivot gun mounted abaft of her foremast exploded from the heat, and at 9.55, her magazine exploded with terrific violence, shattering her in smoking ruins. Nothing remains of her. While in the end, the CSS Nashville slash Thomas L. Rag slash Rattlesnake shared the fate of the Confederacy that she served, the vessel did demonstrate how difficult it was for the Union to maintain the blockade that was the key to the Union plan to defeat the Confederacy. John Corstein of the Mariner's Museum and Park in Newport News, Virginia, said of her, The CSS Nashville was a unique ship. The steamer received the first naval fire of the Civil War. It was the first Confederate commerce raider to serve in the North Atlantic, and was the first Confederate warship to be recognized by Great Britain. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 